This week's program is titled A History of Mystics, East and West, Part 1. You'll hear some historic background during the first part of the program, and then I'll turn it into a spiritual discourse for the rest of the show. So hopefully something for everyone on this week's edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. You'll hear an article about the Mandaean religion of Iraq, and that will turn into an account of some ancient NDEs, ancient near-death experiences. It's time for Spiritual Awakening Radio. There's not just one religion, there are thousands. After years of being concerned that too few voices too few points of view are getting heard when it comes to spiritual paths and world religions. That the radio airwaves were not reflecting the diversity that really exists. I started producing my own programs, exploring the world of spirituality, comparative religion, and books, bringing to the airwaves the gentle voices of saints, the wisdom of masters or mystics, world scriptures, sacred texts, the great spiritual traditions and classics of the East and the West. Darshan Singh, author of the book Spiritual Awakening, once said, Humanity has always dreamed of a golden age. Some imagine it as having existed in the remote past, while others project it into a distant future. For those who have the eyes to read the signs, the golden age of spirituality has already begun, and we are witnessing its dawn. Already, young and old throughout the world are beginning to seek spiritual awakening. Let us speak of peace. Let us listen to the message of love. And once these subjects are begun, let us speak of them from dawn to dawn. My name is James Bean. Welcome to Spiritual Awakening. The Mandaean religion of Iraq. The story of the Mandaeans somewhat resembles the experience of Native American tribes. May they survive. May their ancient wisdom be shared with humanity. And that's what I'm attempting to do here today. In the 1970s, Professor Kurt Rudolph wrote his definitive book on the nature and history of the Gnostic religion, called Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. In the chapter titled A Relic, the Mandaeans, he recorded that at the time there were only about 15,000 Mandaeans left in the world. And the number of Mandaean priests were rapidly dwindling. He described them as a community in somewhat of a state of crisis, not only due to a shortage of priests, but also because of the growing spiritual and cultural gap between the elders, the elders who are the keepers of the ancient knowledge, and the younger generations of Mandaean laity. Kurt Rudolph wrote, the continued existence of the community will essentially depend on whether or not it succeeds in solving the problem of a necessary adaptation to the modern world. Only in this way will the oldest Gnostic religion with its two millennia of history in which it developed its independent Aramaic idiom and lifestyle, as did no other Gnostic sect of the past, be able to survive in the future. And those words were written long before the rise of Saddam Hussein, the Gulf Wars, and the current madness that continues to curse that region. The term Mandaean literally means possessors of secret knowledge. Some Mandaeans live in Iraqi cities like Baghdad and Basra. There's a large population that resides in the smaller market towns and villages of the marshland in southern Iraq and near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The marshlands were partially drained by Saddam Hussein. As I understand it, there has been some successful attempts to restore 
the marshland area of Iraq. Hopefully that process will continue. Iran also has a Mandaean population. Many of them dwell along the Karun River in a western province of Iran. The Prophet Muhammad called them Sabaeans, meaning Baptists or Baptizers, a name which occurs in the Quran and which enabled them to continue under Islamic rule. Islam also categorized the Mandaeans as a people of the book, a religion that possesses their own ancient scriptures. Another factor that has traditionally enabled the Mandaeans to operate in the Islamic world is their affiliation with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is their founding prophet, their greatest prophet. And of course, Islam recognizes John the Baptist. Though the historic connection between John and the Mandaeans is hard to verify, it is indeed possible they are descendants of the disciples of John the Baptist, who 2,000 years ago had a large number of followers which believed him to be a great master, if not the awaited Messiah. Believe it or not, there was a time where John the Baptist, there was a time when John the Baptist was much more popular and much more widely known than Jesus. After John's death, the New Testament portrays Jesus as being the spiritual successor of John, but other leaders in John's community might have seen things differently. It appears that way from reading the Mandaean texts. Like Jesus, others might also have claimed to be John's successor, and thus would have become the leaders of a John community that maintained its independence from the Jesus movement, instead remaining what they were, an unorthodox baptismal sect of the Transjordan. According to scholars of Mandaean studies like Werner Forrester, indeed the origins of the Mandaeans do go back to the Jewish tradition of 1st century AD Palestine and the region of the Jordan River. Forrester states in the book Gnosis II, published by Oxford University Press, that in the context of the Jewish War of Independence and the consolidation of Orthodox Judaism after 70 AD, its position as a minority opposition evidently led to the persecution of the community and finally to its immigration from its native Jordan territory to the east, to begin with in Haran and then the Median hill country, and then eventually in the southern regions of Mesopotamia. Eventually, the Mandaean community settled in the region of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, where they could continue the ritual of baptizing initiates in living waters, rivers like the Jordan, symbolizing the connecting of their souls with heavenly Jordan rivers of light. Familiar-sounding New Testament-ish or Jesus-like sayings from the Mandaean scriptures. This ancient religious community, also known as the Nazareans, still uses a dialect of the Aramaic language. They possess a huge quantity of very beautiful scriptures, mostly in the form of psalms or hymns. Before I begin a study of some of the NDE-like or OOBE-like out-of-body writings or near-death descriptions contained in the Mandaean scriptures, I want to share some examples of passages that sound somewhat familiar to our ears. New Testament or Jesus-like passages. These would be words spoken by those who came from the same Aramaic-speaking Semitic milieu as did Jesus and other messiahs of the Middle East of antiquity. Like, for instance, I am a shepherd who loves his sheep. I protect the sheep and the lambs. I carry them and give them water to drink from the hollow of my hand until they have drunk their full. Give bread, water, and shelter to the poor and persecuted people who suffer persecution. Love and support one another. When you see anyone who is hungry, then satisfy his hunger. When you see anyone who is thirsty, then give him to drink. For whosoever gives, receives. 
Whoever releases a prisoner will find a messenger of life advancing to meet him. My chosen, do not put your trust in the kings, rulers, and rebels of this world, nor in military forces, arms, conflict, and the hosts which they assemble, nor in silver and gold. Their gold and their silver will not save them. Their authority passes away and comes to an end. The word seek and you will find appear on numerous occasions in the Mandaean scriptures. In fact, much more frequently than in the New Testament. And the term place of life often used in the Mandaean texts also appears in another Western apocryphal scripture known as the Gospel of Thomas, which I, of course, have talked about on previous programs. 2,000 years ago, Greek was the Internet, in a, in a way of speaking. Greek was the universal language. So people from various religions started to read each other's books and to communicate. The first wave of Gnosis, there was some kind of transformation in thinking that took place 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, which led to the birth of scores of new and fascinating religious movements, both within and outside of Judaism, including groups like the Sethians, the Therapeutae, the Essenes, Pythagoreans, various Gnostic and Christian groups, various expressions of Christianity. Many of these are categorized as Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Gnostic, meaning they focused upon spiritual or esoteric mystical knowledge. A Gnostic is a knowing one, someone who believes that they know. They are a kind of mystic, someone who perceives beyond the world of the five senses, which could include intuition, as well as revelations, visions, out-of-body travel, exploring the heavens. That's all mysticism. This was the time of the first wave of Gnosis in the Western world. The spark was lit. Some souls started to believe that it was possible for them to personally know the mysteries of God and the heavens, and they sought spiritual wisdom and guidance from various masters, teachers, mystics, prophets, messiahs, and apostles that were around at the time. For the Nazareans or Mandaeans, John the Baptist was God's teacher who had been sent from the light, quote-unquote, to baptize or initiate souls into the experience of the knowledge of life, the great life. Great life is a name for God in the Mandaean religion. There are some examples of visionary literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls, various descriptions of things going on in the heavens. The Mandaean texts seem to be a continuation of that visionary tradition of light mysticism and ascension mysticism. People had visions and wrote them down. In my view, the Mandaean scriptures probably represent the most heavenly or otherworldly documents of the West, somewhat like the Tibetan Book of the Dead, approaching that, brimming with out-of-this-world visions of God, descriptions of the heavens, souls, angels, and life after death. They speak directly to both the heart and soul of the reader, through hymns and prayers of incredible beauty and eloquence. The Coming of the Messenger of Light The role of the heavenly messenger is to give the mystic experience of light to souls and eventually guide them back up to the place of light, the Mandaean term for the highest heaven, where the great life, or God, resides. This role reminds me of the term guru used in Hinduism. The term guru means light giver. Here are a couple of passages from Mandaean holy books on Manda Dahaya, the great heavenly redeemer. It's hard to say if Manda Dahaya, if I'm pronouncing that somewhat correctly, is the name of a literal person or a heavenly being, or perhaps both the illuminator of the worlds of light. In the name of the great life, sublime light be praised. From the place of light I came forth, from you, bright habitation, 
I come to touch hearts, to measure and try all minds, to see in whose heart I dwell. Whoever thinks of me, of him I think. Whoever calls my name, his name I will call. Whoever prays my prayer from the earth, his prayer I will offer from the place of light. I came and found the truthful and believing hearts. When I was not dwelling among them, yet my name was on their lips. I took them and guided them up to the world of light. I became the illuminator of the worlds of light. I became a king to the Nazareans, who receive praise and stability through my name. And by my name they ascend to the place of the light. As for the chosen who put me on as a garment, their eyes were filled with light, and manda dahaya, knowledge of life, was established in their hearts. Beautiful passage from the Mandaean scriptures. Embraced by the light, the mystical encounters recorded in the scriptures of the Mandaeans may seem at times like ancient NDEs, ancient near-death experiences, the visions of souls who were once embraced by the light long ago, about 2,000 years ago. Like, for instance, when I arrived at the water brooks, a discharge of radiance met me. It took me by the palm of my right hand and brought me over the streams of death. Radiance was brought and I was clothed in it. Light was brought and I was wrapped in it. Prayer Son of the good ones, show me the way of the divine beings, spirits or angels, and the ascent upon which your father rose up to, the place of light. He, the discharge of radiance, rose and took me with him and did not leave me in the perishable dwelling. That reading comes from the canonical prayer book of the Mandaeans. Here's my interpretation of that. In the above account, after the soul crossed over to the other side, it was met by a discharge of radiance. That reminds me of something you might see on the sci-fi channel. A discharge of radiance is a deliverer or guide, according to another translation of the same passage, who not only escorted the soul into the beyond, but also gave the soul its heavenly robe of radiance, a garment made of light. It's unclear to me if the soul literally was given a robe of light to put on, or if perhaps this is another way of describing the process of leaving the body at death, taking off the robe of the physical body, which caused the soul to see itself as a being of light. In any case, the soul then prays for its helper and guide to be escorted upward to the place of light. In another version of this account, it says, I lifted mine eyes to heaven, and my soul waited on the house of life. And the life, or God, who heard my cry, sent toward me a deliverer. This version also describes the encounter with the heavenly being, the discharge of radiance, who escorted the soul over the waters of death and accompanied it during the ascension up to the light world. The hymn concludes with these words, Life supported life, life found its own, its own self did life find, and my soul found that for which it had been seeking or searching. Renowned is life and victorious. That's another passage from the canonical prayer book of the Mandaeans. After the break, I want to share with you more visions of the great life or God in the place of the light and share with you some thoughts about the light motif in ancient scriptures of the West. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Walk while you have the light. You are the children of the light. Light, 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 light. There is light within a person of light, and it shines upon the world. You are the light of the world. And so on. The light motif. And then I'll turn the reading into a spiritual discourse on meditation practice. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening. 
My website is at this address, spiritualawakeningradio.com. Stay tuned for more after the break here on HealthyLife.net, Positive Talk Radio. Welcome back to Spiritual Awakening Radio. My name is James Bean, with you every week at this time, exploring the world of spirituality, comparative religion, and books. The website for the program is spiritualawakeningradio.com. From there, you'll find links to articles, blogs, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, various sites. Podcasts are available of the program. spiritualawakeningradio.com. The light motif. If your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. Walk while you have the light. God is light. You are the children of the light. I am the light of the world. There is light within a person of light. Light, light, light. There's a light motif in Western spiritual traditions, Pythagoreans, Platonic thought, the Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions, Hermetic philosophy. There is much light. There is a strong light motif in the Gospel of Thomas and the Nag Hammadi scriptures, the Gnostic Gospels, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Mandaean texts of Iraq as well, most all of the mystical texts too. It gets metaphored to death here in the Protestant West, but these folks in antiquity had the goal of seeing a literal divine light. Rather than, I see the light, meaning I intellectually understand something, the Gnostic or other mystics desired to connect themselves to the divine light during this life as a way to go into the light during the afterlife. What you're attached to now is where you'll end up, is their approach, their philosophy. Whatever you focus your attention on, that's where you'll go. There also have been light mystics within the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox worlds as well. There is a passage in the New Testament that goes, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that's exactly the goal of mysticism, to see the divine light of God during this life. The mystics have a present tense or present moment, kingdom of heaven, and seek to see it, seek to contemplate it via a meditation practice. In many of these Gnostic Gospels, apocryphal texts, and Mandaean scriptures are examples of -of out-of-body travel or ascension through the heavens. There is a system present in these traditions of several planes or heavens, the seven heavens. There were different schools of spirituality, each with its own method of counting, of carving up the heavens. Each had its own living teacher. Some taught that there were seven heavens, others eight, others ten, others twelve. One Gnostic master by the name of Basilides had a system of 365 heavens. It all depends on how you carve things up, how you divide things, lower astral, upper astral, lower causal, and so on. In each case, they all presented a cosmology of several different heavenly realms, each progressively more luminous with less maya or illusion and more spirit, till you get to the top, which has no matter or illusion whatsoever, is all timeless spirit and truth in an eternal state. The music also differs in each of the heavens. St. Paul reported an out-of-body experience in the New Testament. In fact, the term out-of-the-body is found in the New Testament. 
used by the Apostle Paul. He seemed to know that he had been caught up to the third heaven, as opposed to the second heaven or the fourth heaven. In the system he followed, the third heaven was called paradise. The book of First Enoch, a Jewish mystical text, very popular during the early days of Christianity, and before that during the time of the Essenes, also calls the third heaven paradise. Probably not a coincidence. Certain visions, lights, and sounds, or music, or angelic beings are associated with each of the heavens and served as markers along the way, how to tell where you are in your mystical ascent. So, a fascinating account of soul travel, or out-of-body travel, visionary mysticism, and an ability to tell how far you've progressed. Are you in the first heaven? Are you in the second or the third? There are signs, lights, sounds, certain markers that initiates are given. And when they experience those things in contemplative meditation practice, they say, I'm in the first heaven, I'm in the second heaven, I'm in the third heaven or plane. It's a part of the esoteric tradition now, the same approach to mysticism that human beings, while alive, can catch a glimpse of God or the heavens or angels or have an escort into the beyond before death as well as after death, that way of approaching the spiritual path is found in many different traditions. The mystic core, in fact, of each of the world religions has something that resembles this. In the Jewish tradition, this is called Kabbalah. There are masters of the name, Baal, Shem, Tov, and a whole tradition. And if you look at the Essene writings, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are examples of this very thing in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Human beings experiencing visions of the heavens, and some of those visions got written down. The same is true with the Mandaean scriptures of Iraq that I read earlier. In Sufism, Islamic Gnosticism, there are many examples of this. I collect such writings. In my library are many uh, Sufi poet mystics and Gnostic gospels and writings from various Middle Eastern countries with this same approach of traveling through the heavens. And of course, if you have uh, copies of the books of Enoch, those are all about uh, the ascension of the prophet Enoch, especially the book of Second Enoch, describes his encounters through various heavenly regions and having conversations with heavenly beings. And this tradition, of course, uh, is continued in uh, the East. There are many examples of this. My favorite is a book called Sarbachan Radhaswami Poetry, The Spiritual Journeys of Shiv Dayal Singh, also known as Swami Ji Maharaj. East and West this mystical approach has existed and followed by a few fortunate souls. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening. More on this after the break here on HealthyLife.net. Stay with us. program is Spiritual Awakening Radio. Music this week is by Paul Alexander John, a musician friend of mine from Maine. He also spends some time in Florida. He donated this recording to the program, unlicensed, free to use music, just being nice, donated it to the program. So from time to time I use it. Indian classical ragas, and he plays the Bansuri, the Indian bamboo flute. The musician Tori Amos once said, Well, I think the good book is missing some pages. Indeed, there 
are books called Apocryphal Writings, Lost Books of the Bible. I wrote an article, in fact, called Lost Books of the Bible, which has been published and read by people all around the world. And I have a copy of it at my website. I'll even give you the direct address, spiritualawakeningradio.com forward slash lost books. That will take you right to it. It's one of my more popular articles over the years. Describing some of the lost or missing books. And in my case, I tend to gravitate toward the more spiritual, mystical writings that are more interesting, that have more content and literary value. And so I zero in on certain ones, sayings of Jesus, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, visionary mysticism, kind of Eastern sounding writings that might have a lot in common with the poetry of Rumi and the Hindu Upanishads and Thich Nhat Hanh or the Dalai Lama. A lot of advice on spiritual practice. There are some amazing writings that got lost long ago. Essentially, the books of the other Bible represent other people's scriptures, writings used by various groups in antiquity, but never fully embraced by the Roman Empire. And so they disappeared at some point. Writings once used by groups like the Sethians, the Valentinians, the Therapeutae, the Essenes, the Manichaeans, and of course the Mandaeans. I talked about earlier the Mandaean religion of Iraq, the followers of John the Baptist that never signed up for Christianity but maintained their own separate religion and moved to Iraq eventually. The God of time or illusion has put a cover over the teachings of saints and thus concealed them from humanity. That's a verse of poetry from Swamiji Maharaj of Agra, India describing this process of forgetting spiritual knowledge. We forget, we human beings forget, on a personal level and on a planetary level. These mystics come, they write things, they say and do interesting things. Sometimes their followers write down that information and then it gets lost. And then we think there are no Christian mystics. There are no people in Christianity who meditate, have out-of-body experiences. Never heard of that before. Where is the church of Meister Eckhart at the corner of Maine and Union? Haven't found that one yet. And so these, these things are present in Christianity and other world religions, but tend to disappear. Mysticism is a very fragile and subtle thing. Very subtle. It's a teaching and an experience communicated from teacher to student. So if there are no teachers, at some point you'll have no more students. And so there's no one to be a mystic and to appreciate the teachings of other mystics. And so you end up with dusty old scrolls buried underground sooner or later. And then scholars dig them up and go, what are these people talking about? I can't understand any of this. <laughs> So this happens. But as it also says in the Gospel of Thomas, there is nothing hidden that won't become exposed and there is nothing buried that won't be raised. So sooner or later, when the time is right, hopefully, these teachings turn up somewhere and gain a new following. And nowadays, on the shelves of all the bookstores of the world, you'll find copies of Gospel of Thomas, Gnostic Gospels, Nag Hammadi scriptures. Some of those medieval mystics, Meister Eckhart, Hildegard of Bingen, the Philokalia, those writings have become more popular again as people look for spiritual meaning, look for a Christianity with spirituality. And of course, these days, Greek is not the universal language like it was 2,000 years ago, but English is playing that role. And we have the World Wide Web. So once again, like 2,000 years ago, people of one religion are studying the scriptures or teachings of other religions as never before. 
So who knows where things are headed. But hopefully in a, a creative direction, cross-cultural pollination, interfaith dialogue and understanding, peaceful, positive, brotherly relations amongst tribes of humanity, we can hope, as people communicate with each other and understand each other, and realize that we all have many things in common. The mystics of the world have much in common, too. Meditation practices are quite similar, East and West. The spiritual practice revealed in some of these ancient writings of the West, the Gnostic Gospels, for instance, have much in common with Buddhism and Hinduism, Jainism and the Sikh tradition as well. Now, some argue that there actually are examples of historic contact between one religion and another, and that's true, and after the break I can talk about this. But it's also true that uh, one major reason why religions tend to resemble each other is because we're all human beings, we're all carrying around the same divine reality, we're, we're all uh, struggling in a, a dualistic sort of way between human nature on the one hand and that divine spark or self on the other. And so you tend to reinvent similar techniques for, for expanding consciousness. So that's certainly true, but there, there are examples of historic influence of Christian mystics influencing Sufis and then Sufis going to India and influencing people there. Both are true, in other words, at the same time or simultaneously. Both are real. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned. Radio is heard every week at this time. Here's my contact information if you'd like to say hello or have some idea or suggestion for a future program or have a question. I should do a program sometime of people's questions, uh, a mailbag show, if you will, letters from listeners, something like that. Feel free to ask any question, anything on your mind. My email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com James at spiritualawakeningradio.com or simply go to my website you'll see the contact tab with the email address just go to spiritualawakeningradio.com from there there are also links to various social networking sites Twitter, Tumblr Facebook of course and Google Plus spiritual thoughts spiritual teachings Thich Nhat Han said the following, People usually consider walking on water or in thin air a miracle. But I think the real miracle is not to walk either on water or in thin air, but to walk on earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. A blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, the black, curious eyes of a child our own two eyes. All is a miracle. Isn't that wonderful? That's from the Buddhist teacher from Vietnam, I believe, Thich Nhat Hanh. The following is an abstract of a paper by Prem Kali Sharma, professor at Agra, India the Dial Bagh University International Seminar on Religion of Saints SpearCon 2010 booklet. This SpearCon 2010 booklet has this passage, which I found to be quite positive. And it's on consciousness. The word consciousness means conscious and aware. 
As per the Hindi dictionary, four different meanings of the word consciousness are intelligence, tendency of the mind, awareness, and memory. It is clear that the word conscious is used to denote intelligence, tendency related to knowledge, tendency related to memory and awareness. Consciousness is that element in human beings which differentiates them from other inanimate objects. Consciousness basically refers to that power which helps one in understanding and evaluating one's surroundings and environment. By the terms spiritual consciousness is meant the relationship between individual spirit and God. The human body is endowed with the divine spark in the form of spirit. The aim of human life is to recognize that divine element present within and reach the heavenly abode. Love that passage about consciousness, especially spiritual consciousness, becoming aware of the spiritual dimension. We are, of course, uh, very much aware of the world of the five senses and the world of mind and thoughts. Uh, the spiritual state, however, for many remains obscure. Uh, we have that part of ourselves as well. As Param Sant Tulsi Sahib, a saint from Hathras, India, during the 19th century, once said, Within this body shines the entire universe. Meditation, namely contemplative meditation, is a way to access that spiritual dimension, and indeed many dimensions or heavens. Spiritual practice. Contemplative meditation is a way to temporarily tune out the world of the five senses and the thoughts of the mind and to access that other part of ourselves, to get to know it, to get to know ourselves. The Sufi poet mystic Rumi once said, All is known in the sacredness of silence. And this passage comes from Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj. Whatever little is possible, do meditation every day. But never give up or discontinue meditation. You will definitely meet with success. Another Eastern master once said, The practitioners should perform meditation daily with yearning zeal and regularity. There are mystical groups within each of the great world religions that have practiced meditation, and that includes Christianity Judaism and Islam. Islamic mystics are known as Sufis. The Jewish tradition has Kabbalah, and there have been many mystical Christian groups over the centuries. This is a passage I found in a Syriac Aramaic book called The Acts of Thomas. To be glorified art thou, the Father Supreme, born of thy firstborn, in the silence and tranquility of meditation. In the Hebrew book of Psalms, it says, Be still and know that I am God. That's a great definition of what meditation is. The following reading comes from a Quaker book, Quaker Spirituality Selected Writings, published by Paulist Press, and is by Caroline Stephen. The one cornerstone of belief upon which the Society of Friends is built is the conviction that God does indeed communicate with each one of the spirits he has made, in a direct and living in-breathing of some measure of the breath of his own life, that he never leaves himself without a witness in the heart, as well as in the surroundings of man, and that, in order clearly to hear the divine voice thus speaking to us, we need to be still, to be alone with him in the secret place of his presence." That's also a very interfaith kind of book. It's a book of Quaker mystics published by Paulist Press, which is a Catholic book company. And Paulist Press also publishes the writings of some Eastern teachers as well, Hindu and Buddhist. So, fairly interfaith book company. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening Radio. I can send you some free introductory meditation instructions you can try out in the privacy of your own home. It'll come to you in the form of an email. 
Request the introductory meditation instructions by emailing me at this address, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com.